quickly, let me tell you about Skowhegan. Uh, where are we, right? Skowhegan, down the road, you went through Skowhegan, I'm sure, was settled in 1772. Uh, interestingly, when Benedict Arnold made his march to, to Quebec, that was in 75, the trail beyond Skowhegan, so that tells you how we are kind of in the frontier, was mapped by Native American guides. So on, this area was settled by veterans from the Revolutionary War. So they were given plots of land. Um, that happened in 1782. Um, they were from Massachusetts, of course. Why do I say of course? Because there was no Maine. <laughs> Well, we were here. <laughs> this is the interesting, right, right, but this was Massachusetts. This is the interesting thing about Colby. It was founded when it was still Massachusetts. It didn't happen for a few years. Um, this area around uh, the meeting house was deeded to a man from Boston, Thomas Spaulding, who divided what, as you know, was known in those days as a plantation into 160 acre plots. Um, if you purchased Mildred Cummings' book, although I think we've been talking about maybe digitizing it and putting it on the website, which would be a, a good service to the world, but Mildred Cummings, or Millie Cummings, has a few really interesting um, lines on the settling process, which I was really interested to find out took four years. Because first, you would choose where you want to settle. And, and of course, since it wasn't farmland, it was wooded. So the first thing you would do is chop the, the trees, but you can't build with those trees. You have to let them dry. So hence, you know, the lengthy process before you could actually build your house and, and really live in, on, on the spot uh, you would, uh, you know, be allowed to, to take care of. Okay, Solon established a first Congregational Church of Christ that was in 1806. Okay, we've made it to the 19th century. Then there was a church uh, in Solon Village that was built in 37, and then this one. Okay, we're getting closer. This one was built in 42, 1842. Uh, quick look at the building. Um, yeah, it's your average, basic, gorgeous, nevertheless, but pretty basic New England meeting house. Stylistically, it has some interesting elements. Gothic. Gothic. Exactly. Teeny, teeny bit of Gothic revival with those pointed arches over the window uh, and the door. Um, many of the elements are still, I mean, the whole ground plan, of course, the windows, the shape of the windows, the, the steeple. When we go inside the podium, the pews beautifully painted in different shades because they were, of course, by families, so you would choose the color you wanted to paint inside. Um, original paint because it's milk paint. Um, we're here to talk about frescoes, so I won't go on about milk paint, but it's indestructible. Um, you know what milk paint is? Right, okay. No? You bind the pigments with milk, with, with casein, and that makes for an extremely strong uh, binder. Most early American furniture is painted with milk paint, and, okay, I'm, I'm making too many parentheses here, but who's been to Sabas Day Lake? Not enough people. <laughs> Guys, the only place on earth where you still have shakers. Yeah. Not for long, right? Because they can't reproduce. So. But the meeting house, the, 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 the space, right? Uh, the original one, the, the summer one, because the, otherwise they, they meet inside another spot that's heated, um, is painted blue, beautiful blue. Never been painted again since the place was built, I think, in 1857. Uh, it's a mixture of sage, myrtle, and blueberry, mm -hmm. and it's with milk. You don't need to repaint it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, where was I? Um, so, okay, the village. What happened to the village? There was a period of, of decline for several reasons. It's really sad what's following, so pull out your Kleenex. Um, the first thing that happened was factories were developing. Uh, where were the factories? On the river. By the rivers right? No river. So people going into the factories. Then there was World War I. Either the men left because of the draft, or they were working in shipyards, uh, in mills, right, to support the war effort. So, you know, more kind of hemorrhaging of, of people. 
the place became progressively isolated. Um, you know that a town is no more when, and this is what happened to Solon, there was no more post office, store, or schoolhouse. Final blow. Highways are built in Maine in the 20s, nowhere near, right? So totally isolated. So you can imagine the situation. Okay, now we step into the 20th century. I mean, I've already done that with the highways. A first restoration took place in 39. At that point, it reopened, the meeting house reopened after 35 years of abandon. And you know what happens to an, a building left abandoned in central Maine, right? it gets, it degrades even more. Then, Willard H. Cummings, <coughs> right, keep in mind the H, and his wife, Helen Warren Cummings, purchased, they had a farm down the road, more on this later, purchased land around what is, you know, around the meeting house. And Helen Cummings, spearheaded the restoration of the building. And then on, they started having services regularly, so it was used again. Um, so, then we come to the son of Willard H. Cummings, Willard W. Cummings, who, along with Charles Cutler, Henry Varnum Poor, and Sidney Simon, founded the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture just down the road just a few miles. Uh, that happened in 46. Um, that was their farm, and you still have an original building, right? The, the Red House is, was the, their building, their, their, their farm, uh, their farmhouse. Uh, Cummings not only founded the Skowhegan School, but was very important in the founding of the Colby College Museum of Art. He was a painter, a portraitist, talk a little bit, we have some of his paintings inside. Um, we have at Colby a portrait he made, among other things, of Betty Davis. Um, and with the gift uh, of, er, of paintings that he gave to, uh, to Colby, that was one of the, the, the kind of the, the kernels, the founding uh, collections that went into Colby. He named it after his mom, mother and father. It's the Helen Warren and Willard Howe How Cummings Collection of American Art. And that was kind of, and this is probably one of the reasons Colby, Colby's museum has been specializing in American art because it happened since its inception, which, by the way, was remarkably recently, right? It, it was in, in, the, in the middle of the, the 20th century. Um, Helen Warren Cummings was Colby class of 11. So there was a definite Colby connection. I could, there were several campaigns of, restoration for the building, but one, for instance, and this I think tells you a lot about the state of the place, was in 51, and this is when the building finally received electricity. Tells you something about central Maine, uh, way into the, the middle of the 20th century. Eventually, uh, it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, Martha Young, where is Martha, was very very instrumental in, in that happening. And if you ask Andy or any of the board members who've been there for, for longer, they can tell you uh, what it takes to maintain um, a place like that. So, if it's a typical M New England meeting house outside, just wait until you go inside. That's why I didn't want you to go inside first. I will explain what we're going to do now. You're going to go inside uh, the central two rows of the pews are reserved to the Farnsworth docents. Everybody else can sit wherever you want. We will sit there and I will talk about all the frescoes we can see from there as we are seated. So don't sit too closely so you can kind of, you know, rotate and look around. Uh, so we'll do that. It's going to be chilly, you've been warned, so uh, bundle up, we'll go inside. I will describe everything from uh, where, from the pews, you'll be ev even able to see some of the paintings up on the, the choir, the choir loft. Uh, as we exit, you can go there. I will also describe the paintings uh, that um, are in the outside, in the, in the inside, right, but not in the sanctuary per se. 
Um, and as we exit, uh, I will then show you some that are in fact here behind and we can try to, uh, you know, fit all together so we can briefly look at them. So that's the plan. Okay? You can ask me questions afterwards. <laughs> and uh, Catherine should keep time so uh, we don't miss lunch. So, um, did you say wow when you came in? <laughs> I didn't pay attention. That was the idea that, you know, you would be, do you expect that? No, of course not. Someone, a journalist, called this the Sistine Chapel of Maine or of New England. It's kind of funny because I worked on a, a, a pilgrimage chapel in southern France that has been called the Sistine Chapel of the Alps. So I guess I'm destined to work on Sistine chapels outside of Rome. Um, so why did this happen? So the story is really fascinating. Um, there was a rich lady whose name was Margaret Blake, um, Margaret Day Blake, uh, Day was her maiden name, um, who had married Tiffany Blake, who was um, the editor, what was he, the chief editor um, of the Chicago Tribune, what was she? Yeah, the chief editorial writer to the Chicago Tribune. By then, he, um, Tiffany Blake had already died, so she was a widow. I guess she had time on her hand. She was really interested in the arts, um, was actually the first uh, female member of the Board of Trustees of the Chicago Art Institute, had traveled widely uh, to Italy, among other places, um, and had taken classes at the, the Skowhegan, at the fairly recently founded Skowhegan School. More on that in a minute. And she decided when, of course, the Cummings being, you know, having land around the, the meeting house, being very involved in the restoration of the meeting house, um, would show it. So she became aware of this place and decided that it should be painted in fresco. Why fresco? Well, of course, she had traveled to Italy. She had seen churches with frescoes. But more importantly, the Skowhegan School is the only place in America where fresco has been taught as a medium since the very inception of the school. Um, I'll tell you more on, about that uh, later on. Um, but she decided to start to fund a fellowship to find artists to contribute frescoes to decorate uh, the inside. So she established uh, that Margaret Blake Fellowship to select artists. Uh, and in the, the statement establishing that fund, it said that it would be done under the supervision of the school. So it's very much connected to Skowhegan as, as a school, not just because it's frescoes. You'll see why. Um, she definitely had money, as I said, right? I mean, when you become a trustee of the Chicago Art Institute, that means that you have some means. The first call was issued in 1951. And listen to this. Among the jurors who selected the artists were some important artists, of course, members of the Skowhegan faculty, but also people like René Darnoncourt, who happened to be the director of MoMA at the time, or John Bohr, who was the director of the Whitney. So that tells you something, right, about the Skowhegan School and the connections. I mean, we might be out here in central Maine, but, right, I mean, this is the whole history of the arts uh, in Maine. Um, and of course, you know, the founding fathers of the school, school had just been founded, what, um, five years prior, uh, Willard Cummings, Henry Varnum Poor, Sidney Simon, and Poor, who's the daughter of Henry Varnum Poor, was also very much involved. And Anne Poor, uh, as um, Faye Hirsch, uh, a scholar who's currently writing a book on the history of Skowhegan, um, good friend, she published, <laughs> she used to be uh, the editor of Art on Paper, so I've known her forever. Um, when Faye talks about Anne Poor, she says she's really like the fourth founder. Um, the daughter, right, female, apparently a difficult person. I think she might not have been such a difficult person. You know, the usual thing. <laughs> no, you know what I mean, right? 
you're a woman, you're a bit assertive, you know what you're called. <laughs> I will not say it because I get in trouble when I say those things. But so that's my, my sense because I think she, that, I mean, Faye is really thinks she was, thank you for shaking your head. We'll have to talk more. You seem to, you seem to know things. Hmm. <laughs> so, um, so, okay. Here's how what artists were told. This is the brief. It's very important. There shall be no limitation of subject matter. However, bearing in mind the religious character of the building, which is non-sectarian from its inception, it is suggested that the New and Old Testament offer rich and suitable subject matter. The material should not limit the approach, but should be interpreted in imaginative terms, which allow complete freedom to develop symbols, associations, or legends. So it took place between, so the, the first call was issued in 51, the actual painting started in 52, and went on until 56. As you can see, it was completely covered in fresco. Uh, Inside here, it's all uh, related to scripture. The lobby has some uh, secular depictions. I'll tell you about them um, as we go out. So, and, you know, a, a logical kind of opposition, right, between the place where services are held and, um, yeah, the more secular kind of transitional space. We'll talk about the transitional nature of that lobby. Um, so, this is where it started, with um, the West Wall, which is very typical, right? When, when you would build churches in the Middle Ages, you always started um, on the West. So you could immediately start, uh, wait a minute, is this is the West Wall, so it's not oriented. This is very annoying, sorry. When you would, right, because North, anyway. That makes no sense. Um, nobody would have done that in the Middle Ages. <laughs> right, churches are oriented, as in they face east, they face towards Jerusalem, unless, you know, you have a ravine and more build, you know, maybe, unless you have reasons, but typically, and that's why I got confused, you always start your church on the east, so you could Im immediately be celebrating masses, and then you keep adding to it. So, but still, yeah, this was not oriented, I know we're not in Europe, I know we're not in a Catholic church, so anyway. This started there. Makes sense, because this is the focal point. So the first um, time the Margaret Blake Fellowship was awarded, it was to William King. King um, was born in 1925, so he was 27 years old when he was uh, 26 or 27. I, I didn't check exactly when his birthday was, but you get the idea. Um, he eventually became famous as a sculptor. An interesting um, gossipy tidbit, he was um, the first husband uh, of Lois Dodd. Yeah. We have at Colby an amazing sculpture, which is a portrait of Lois by William King. Who's met Lois Dodd? Who's the most delightful human being, who deserves more recognition? Let's not go there. Why and why others who are similar? I shouldn't be saying those things if I'm going to be recorded, so I will not. Uh, can, can we also cut things, John? After oh, good, we can do some montage. Okay, um, I'm thinking of other artists of her generation who've had more rec recognition and who have. Yeah. Anyway, you, you know, you know whom I'm thinking about. So we have a cutout. Um, so those of you who've, who've met Lois, she has the best nose on earth. <laughs> if you haven't paid attention to her nose, check out her nose. And that, I'm saying that because the cutout William King did that we have captures that profile to a T. So he really became a sculptor. So this is an interesting issue, right? These are young artists and they might not have become fresco artists. Um, in fact, he completely switched um, media. Um, the decision was made on the basis of sketches, so people entering the composition had to uh, suggest, you know, had to show what they were planning on doing. He was selected, the jury was composed of René Darnoncourt, the director of MoMA, two artists, Jack Levine and Franklin Watkins, and members of the permanent faculty of uh, Skowhegan. Um, 
this is interesting what happened with this wall, which as you can see is a pretty big expanse. He was assisted by two artists, by Philip Bornath, who is uh, the artist who contributed the pen and ink drawings that um, went to illustrate this book, and at Colby, that came with the archives. We have the original drawings. In fact, we have a few more than you know the ones that were finally included in the book. And then another artist, uh, Micheline Beaumont, also collaborated. And interestingly, after that, it was decided that from then on there would be only one artist, uh, maybe you know receiving some help, some technical help. But obviously, this didn't work too well, so they changed after that. So. What do we have? Okay, so these are all, we start at the beginning. Um, we'll, it's of course um, the Old Testament. Uh, we start with a creation, which interestingly um, is not exactly, it's an unusual scene for, you know, to kind of encapsulate um, the very beginning of the book of Genesis. We see uh, the creation of the sun, but uh, also of the moon. And this is interesting. We didn't really realize the moon was there until um, Carter, the student who worked on this section. So what you will find on the website, when the website goes live, is uh, each of the students in the class, there were 12 students, chose a section of the, the meeting house, of the frescoes, and then uh, produced also a biography on the artist and, and an analysis of that section. So we had um, an archival photo of Bill King painting his fresco, and he was in fact on a scaffolding about uh, this high, painting this section, and the moon was much more clear uh, in, that, in that black and white photo, unfinished fresco. So that's when um, the student was like, oh, this is what's happening, sun uh, and moon. So we start with that. Then here we have the flood. Now, what you will see uh, happening in, in, in all the spaces is the artist not only producing very interesting um, kind of interpretations of scripture, uh, when students worked on their sections. They also had to look at what we art historians call the iconography, right? how the scene is represented in art, and that allowed them to assess how, whether they were following the established tradition or just inventing something, right? Um, and so what happened here as well, not only they were thinking about what's themes to choose, how to represent them, but make sense of the space, use the space to, uh, you know, place those scenes. And so you'll see how artists take advantage of the rather large windows, right, that are really interrupt in interrupting the, those walls. So what the, the student who worked on this section noticed is, yes, you have the flood with, with you know, the, the, the rain falling down, um, but look how um, he, he said it's interesting because it's, the window is right there, so I, on days when it's raining, it's raining outside, it almost continues what you see painting. On days it's sunny, you have the sun, the light streaming down, right? So it, it kind of works very nicely with um, the actual uh, architectural element. So, okay, the flood. Then we get to the really here central focal point, something very unusual. That's really King's invention. We have this kind of ball of fire with some trumpets. So you, you get this almost synesthetic experience where you see the light, but you also uh, hear the sound of the, the blasting trumpets. Um, and this, in fact, goes with this figure. This is Moses, who is receiving the tablets of the law. Um, and, and it's kind of combined maybe a little bit with um, um, the tablet. It's almost like God is, is, is throwing those tablets to him, like Frisbee style. I don't know if I would want to be in his in his position, you know, that close with two chunks of, 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 of stone coming your way, projected by, uh, by this uh, rather, you know, dynamic and, and almost scary uh, kind of manifesta theophany manifestation of God. Um, you, if you come closer later on, and we'll talk about that um, with another uh, scene later on, you might notice that he has horns. Or almost, it could look like um, little, you know, cat's ears 
you know, the way kids wear, um, you know. <laughs> um, uh, if you could avoid uh, reclining against the fresco, please. I, I made an announcement before you showed up. Um, anybody knows why Moses in art is represented with horns? For instance, in a famous sculpture by Michelangelo, he's got really clear horns. It's a mistranslation from uh, the Bible. Uh, in the Bible, when he comes down after having received the, 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 the tablets of the law, it described that there's rays of light, and, and the word for rays was misunderstood, and so from then on he's represented with horns. And it, it, it kind of, nobody said, wait a minute, the translation is wrong, the idea caught up because it gives him a certain kind of sense of power, right, to see the, this figure with, with horns. Um, then we get the plagues of Egypt, also notice the, the parallel, right, the flawed, streaming down, the plagues of Egypt also coming down, kind of like, like rain, if you will. Um, here you get the golden calf, right, um, with, with people adoring it uh, at the bottom. And then um, things are looking up. Uh, we see the parting of the Red Sea. Interestingly, when, when Carter analyzed the, the iconography, um, it's a very positive rendition of the scene. You only see the Israelites being spared thanks to the parting of the sea. You don't see anybody being you know, killed by drowning. And then finally, it, this is really about kind of the, the, the end of the life of Moses. Uh, there he is again with his horns, um, but turning his back to you, looking in the distance, um, it's, uh, it's the end of his life. He's looking towards the promised land. The scene can also be referred to the death of Moses. By the way, in all these traditional scenes, I, I can't stress that enough, if you look at art all the way to the 18th century at least, there's no titles. People didn't put titles to their works. The idea of assigning titles to works starts, that's why I chose the 18th century as starting point, with, for instance, those exhibition institutions known as the salon. And you guys know the expression salon style hanging, right? When you, why was that? Because the salon had, it was packed with, with paintings, right? And that's why people would paint huge things because you, you would be sure to be noticed. No, seriously. If, you, if you've ever read uh, Zola's uh, L'Oeuvre, the work, they talk about those big works as grand machine, you know, great machines, um, and you would have a checklist. So imagine a checklist identifying works that are in an exhibition space that is completely covered with art, that's when you need a title. And so that started, and, and I tell my students all the time, even a work that is untitled, Right? When, when you see the label and it says untitled, that's a choice of the artist. So even untitled is a title, if you see what I mean. So that's why when I'm referring to scenes, they can be referred in different ways because it's the scene, it's not really the title um, itself. Here's what Bill King said about um, this, his, um, his wall, if you will. I hoped so for his paintings, to have a lot of repose and serenity in spite of the subject matter. So each of these artists really projected what they saw, how they thought about those scenes, of course, chose the scenes in, um, in, in function of that. So let's move to the south wall. And this is interesting. This wall is one of the rare spaces in the, the church, in the, the, the meeting house, sorry, uh, you'll see why I made this uh, slip, where we have scenes from the New Testament. Uh, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later as well, why that is, that so much of the, the paintings deal with the Old Testament uh, rather than the New Testament, or definitely quite a bit. While, as you know, scenes from the, the Old Testament are not so frequent. I mean, right, you, when you think about uh, religious art, of course, I mean, you know, Europe being overwhelmingly Christian, most of the traditions these people were, if they were looking at the tradition were thinking about, had mostly to do with New Testament scenes, and yet we have quite a bit of Old Testament depictions here. So, 
Uh, and there too, you'll see how interesting uh, the choices are. So here, for instance, we have a very unusual scene. Can, oh, it's not reaching. Yes, here. Um, taking advantage of that space above the window, uh, it's people preparing the Last Supper. And indeed, we get the Last Supper down here um, in an abbreviated format, because how many people were present at the Last Supper? 13, that's why you should never have 13 people at the table, right? Because one was not going to do something uh, nice afterwards. You can count how many people are there. Um, they are in reduced number. Um, I'm doing this with trepidation. So we have Christ. Ah, am I losing this? Oh, God. I think, oh, there we go. This might be too far. Okay, Christ. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six apostles. And then we have a seventh one who is not around the table. Uh, any idea who that is? Yeah, Ivor, you're right by him. Yeah, here. It's, it's, it's Judas, and he's got the money bag. And one coin, in case you, you didn't make, you know, if you thought that bag contains, I don't know, candy, uh, just making it clear. <laughs> I mean, it makes no sense. He's got his money before. I mean, we have actually in Christian art scenes where, he's, where they're co counting the coins to make sure he gets all 30 silver coins. But anyway, and notice, he's facing us. He's about to exit the scene, right? To, to um, the, I, 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 Guys, I, I could spend an hour telling you about the iconography of that scene. If you're interested, this is going to sound awful. Read my book. Because <laughs> I, I worked on a cycle of frescoes where it's fascinating, the most important figure, it's a cycle on the life of Christ and the most important figure after Christ, the most present, the most consistently present in the series of frescoes is Judas. And what is said through the figure of Judas is extremely complex. Um, in a nutshell, we think of him as a really awful figure, but Without him, Christ wouldn't have been crucified. The patriarchs would still be waiting in limbo. Right? I mean, Christ had to, well, so it's very complicated, and theologians really reflected upon it. That's why, I mean, I could spend uh, 500 pages on it, and I did, but I will not now. <laughs> I can give you the reference if you're interested. So then let's move on. Um, we continue with the life of Christ. Well, actually, it's over. <laughs> At least on earth, this is the ascension. There's Christ leaving. Notice how cleverly it's positioned within um, the, the wall, kind of interrupted uh, by the, the end of, that, uh, of the wall. Um, you have a guy with a big key. No, it's not St. Peter, um, but it's someone who's kind of witnessing what's happening. Notice how he helps direct your glance there, right? He, he kind of ties a little bit uh, the two. Here we have, by the way, something very unusual going on. This is a complete invention uh, of the artist, um, a very kind of abstract motive. It's, a, it's, it's opening the gates of heaven, and what you have in the center is um, the monogram of Christ. The, the first three letters, um, Jesus, right, I-H-S, in uh, what really looks very much like a host. A host in the Middle Ages would be actually made, you know, with waffle presses, literally, and, and they would have, like, they could have a, a pattern uh, imprinted on them. Um, and as you know, of course, the Last Supper is when the Mass, uh, is what then gives birth to the Mass. Each time the Mass is celebrated, in a way, the Last Supper is commemorated, um, which is interesting because what was the Last Supper but a Seder, which itself is a commemorative kind of, of meal, right? We could, again, spend time there. Um, so here we have Christ's ascension, just witnessed by a, a, a few uh, followers of, of Christ. Normally, you would see the scene with all the, the, the apostles there. Well, all but one. Uh, no, this one, no, they're all there. But so again, very pared down, very uh, reduced scene. Notice what, what 
big areas of empty space we have, right? And, and you can see the differences in style with, with other artists. Uh, color scheme, this is amazing. Each artist has their style, has a very distinctive color scheme, and yet notice how cohesive the, the ensemble is. It, it's, in a way, it's, it's quite miraculous. Um, and finally, we have something that happens way after Christ has gone up. Um, it's Pentecost, the descent of the, the, the Holy Spirit, uh, represented as a dove here. Here's the apostles again in reduced number. Uh, usually Pentecost, you have the apostles and the Virgin Mary together. Uh, so again, uh, we have three, six people, that's it. Um, rays descending from the dove, but also notice that this is completely um, the innovation of Thomas Mickelson, um, how we get a, a triangle that gets kind of um, designed, which at least since the Baroque time is the symbol for the Trinity. You see depictions of the Trinity with a, a triangular halo. Um, so an allusion to the Trinity, and as a matter of fact, uh, if you think about who makes up the Trinity, who are, to speak uh, uh, theological jargon, the hypostasis, you have the Holy Spirit, uh, the Father, and the Son, right, with a cross for, uh, for Christ. So that's for Thomas Nicholson. Oh yes, and as you know, in typical representations of the Pentecost, as they get um, as the grace of God, as the Holy Spirit descends upon the apostles, uh, they're usually represented with tongues of fire uh, kind of uh, on their heads, and that's exactly what we get here. So, um, in a way, well, this is very unusual. There's something really missing here. If you think about, okay, you're going to paint a wall on the history, on the story of Christ. What do you think you would have, no matter what? Hmm? The crucifixion, missing, right? So Nicholson made very specific choices, and what he really focused on is the relationship between Christ and the apostles, right? So you can see how he, each of these artists interpreted uh, holy scripture, holy history, and the scenes they chose with, with an agenda, right? A very personal agenda. Let's turn to the North Wall. Um, okay, uh, first, I mean, interesting thing, this was painted by an artist um, whose name was Alfred Blaustein. Uh, he was 29 years old then, uh, and he was invited, he didn't enter the competition, Mrs. Blake and uh, the Skowhegan faculty invited him to participate. Um, quick question to you guys, when I say his name is Alfred Blaustein, Given the setting here, any comment? Well, that's a giveaway, isn't it? Yeah, he was Jewish. And we'll meet other uh, Jewish artists in, uh, shortly. So I won't tell you more about that now. I want you to think about it. I want you to think about the potential paradox to have a Jewish artist, and he, he wasn't converted, don't go imagine things, just a good Jewish artist contributing a, uh, um, you know, an ensemble of paintings for a Christian place of worship. So here we go back to the Old Testament. Uh, we go back to uh, a little later after, actually it follows nicely this because these are our scenes that come from the book of Exodus. Um, and um, it, we start with the story of Job where we see um, God sending all kinds of calamities uh, to poor Job, who uh, is represented here, crippled. Uh, you know, he had sores on his body. Um, he is mocked uh, by the so-called three foolish men. Um, and you can see that Blaustein's um, style um, fits well this kind of, of, of choice of scenes, right? You can really call his style quite expressionistic. Uh, notice how angular uh, uh, the way he, he depicts um, um, shapes uh, are, right? This, this, it's a little cubistic, right? It's a little cubist inspired, but it really conveys um, rather strong uh, emotions. Uh, the color scheme is, is quite strange. It, you could say it's pastel, 
But if I wanted to be completely colloquial, I would say they're rather yucky pastel colors. <laughs> right, they're a little sickly. I mean, look at that, that, that um, um, yeah, what is it? Is, is it Pepto-Bismol that is that pink? <laughs> Right? I mean, they, 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 he is really very successful at conveying a, a sense of, of, of anguish, which is exactly what's going on here with you know, Job having all those calamities um, uh, happening, being mocked. Um, then, okay, then things are changing a bit. Here we have um, two scenes that are kind of combined. We get the burning bush. And then also um, this uh, other scene that appears in, in the book of Exodus, Aaron's rod, uh, which is an interesting scene. It happens before Pharaoh. Um, God sends Moses and his brother Aaron to the Pharaoh. Uh, and he says, take your rod and cast it down before Pharaoh that, that it may become a serpent. And it does. But then Pharaoh's sorcerers said, wait a minute, we can do that too. So they cast down their own rods, they also become serpents, but in the end they lose because uh, Aaron's rod, the serpent that, you know, that, that came out of that rod, uh, swallows those other serpents, those competitors. So that was in fact a warning from God that Pharaoh doesn't listen to, that Pharaoh uh, ignores. And this is the reason for the plagues of Egypt. So, no, that looked like a, a nice, you know, very cheerful scene. You know. No, what follows is again something that in a way echoes what had happened to, to poor Job, right? Calamities, something that plagues people. Uh, here as well, notice how they're use, he's using, how uh, Blaustein is using the space, right? Putting the, the three foolish men up there, above the window, using that, that more vertical space for the burning bush uh, and, and, uh, and Aaron's uh, rod here. Um, and then, okay, going on, um, we get uh, a very interesting scene here with uh, sacrificial animals, so three uh, sacrificial sheep. And then something here that um, I think, yeah, you could think, is it about different faiths? Is it about Judaism and Christianity? Yes, you could think so, right? We get the tablets of the law, we get the Star of David, and we get uh, a cross for Christianity. I think it's something else, or maybe I'm, I'm reading it as a medievalist. In medieval tradition, I mean, in, in, in theological tradition, okay, who's been to the Sistine Chapel? And I bet when you went there, you were like that. Did you do that for the whole time, or did you look at the walls? I hope you looked at the walls. Because, <laughs> you know, there's people like Botticelli who painted some of the walls. Except, ask most of the people who are all like that, are you looking at the walls? They're not. Um, the back wall, yes, it's Michelangelo as well, so, okay. Um, but this, the program of the Sistine Chapel was structured according to what I'm going to tell you is symbolized by those three symbols. Michelangelo was the last one to paint when he did the ceiling, but that was the beginning, in fact, right? That's where you have the creation of Adam, for instance. You're all, fam you're all familiar with that, that scene, right? With Adam looking a little, mm, waiting for the sparkle of life, right? About to happen um, as God is going to touch his finger. That is, as theologians would call it, ante legem. It's humanity before they received the law, before Moses received the law. And that could be symbolized uh, by this, because then you have the tablets of the law, which ushers the next moment in, in, in history, if you will, which is referred to as ante, uh, uh, um, sub lege, under the law. Right now, the Israelites are living under the law. And then eventually comes Christianity, uh, which uh, the theologians would refer to as uh, sub gratia. So it's a kind of an all-encompassing um, uh, timeline, uh, if you will, with the sacrificial animals next to it. More on this in a minute, uh, and you'll see it makes um, perfect sense, because what do we have next? 
yeah, we have something rather horrific going on here, um, but in fact, this is a very personal interpretation of a scene that has somehow connects with our three sacrificial sheep here because what we have here is Abraham sacrificing Isaac. This is Isaac and this is Abraham, the most scary Abraham ever with not just a knife as he usually is represented if you look at you know Ghiberti and, and everybody else but a scythe a, a, a scythe am I pronouncing it right um, and often you would see God about to stop him no God in sight so serious cliffhanger not to mention poor Isaac looks it's pretty scary, right? The, the way he's kind of caught in this, in this thorny kind of um, bush. Um, and interestingly, but we know what happens next, right? God stops Abraham, Isaac is spared, God, um, and, and, and um, Abraham will replace what he was, you know, the sacrifice he was planning to, to do with, <laughs> with, his son, with his son with a ram. So you can see how that creates an interesting um, echo or connection with th those three sacrificial animals placed immediately uh, above the window. Notice again the placement, uh, the, the, how they're taking advantage uh, of the space, how Abraham seems to be coming out of the choir loft, kind of descending upon um, Isaac, how your eye is guided down again, right, in, in a way bringing you back into the composition of that wall. Okay, uh, oh, here's what, final point, here's what uh, Blaustein said about uh, his, his contribution. Eventually, I became interested in what constitutes faith, how, how that faith is expressed, and how and why faith is maintained, right? A whole set of very, very challenging uh, depiction moments in, in the history. Um, he also said that, yeah, throughout the wall, he was trying to express the timelessness of the questions of faith and sacrifice. I will not let you go out without talking more about Ben Sean. You'll see why. So what we have, the scene he chose to depict, it's just one scene. Right, one, um, more, well, yes and no, you'll see why. It's, it's Christ uh, teaching to the multitude by the Sea of Galilee. Uh, it's in Mark, uh, one uh, of um, chapter four, just two verses, one to three. And as he's preaching, he's telling the parable of the, of the sower. Uh, and if you look at the very top here, you have someone sowing, right, sowing seeds. So, you know, you can go read Mark, you can go read the, um, the website if you want the details of what's happening, but that's not the main thing. It's how he's representing that, right? Christ preaching. Um, because of the style, it's hard to pick up Christ, but there he is, right? Gesturing to the multitude. And this is, of course, the Sea of Galilee with, in the background, what he's talking about, the, the, the parable of the sower. What do you notice about Christ? Anything special about him? He's dark, right? Not because he's been sailing on the Sea of Galilee for a long time and forgot his sunblock. No, he's represented as a black man. Which, of course, you know, coming from Ashley Bryan makes perfect sense. The other thing you might notice when you look at kind of stylistically, some of the, 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 the treatment of the face that I think is particularly compelling Jesus, now this is not working. The, 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 the man behind him who's holding the mast of the boat, um, his, hair, his face looks very much like an African mask, yes. right? Something that was done so much by the Cubists, then also by the German Expressionists, you know, earlier in the 20th century as well. Um, and, and of course, the fact that they're on a boat, it's an allusion to the, the apostles who were uh, fishermen. Right, who were recruited, some of whom were recruited, as it, as it were, while well, they were uh, fishing um, uh, uh, also on, on a lake. So now, the way he worked out this composition, it's filled with echoes of several things. 
He worked on sketches he had made at markets, for instance, while he was visiting his parents' native um, home uh, of Antigua, uh, which you can see why there's um, a Caribbean uh, kind of a tropical uh, feel to, to, to the very lush colors. Um, don't get me wrong, there's palm trees in the Holy Lands, right? I mean, Palm Sunday, hello, right? So, sure, but, but that adds this kind of, of tropical feel. Uh, it makes sense, all of a sudden, as well. The other thing we should keep in mind is that Ashley Bryan, who was a lifelong lover of music, um, had made it to, um, um, in, in the summer of 50, so just a couple of years prior to painting that, um, he had made it to the concerts that Pablo Casals was giving in honor of uh, the 200th anniversary of Bach's passing. And during the rehearsals, um, he was allowed to sketch. And uh, he said that that experience was very um, fundamental for him. He said, as he was sketching to the, the sound of the great Pablo Casals playing, I'm quoting Ashley, I found the rhythm of my hand. And there's indeed a musical um, element in the very rhythmic, very gestural, right, handling of, of the paint uh, in, these, uh, in his fresco. And in fact, there is one more musical connection. Before you go out, peek just where Martha is. If Martha looks down uh, to that corner, she will s that signals where you should look. There's an inscription, and that inscription reads, Soli Deo Gloria glory to God alone, which is the same Latin phrase Bach used to sign his compositions. Isn't that amazing? By the way, all the frescoes are signed. So for instance, Tom Nicholson's signature is right here with a year. Uh, Ashley Bryan's signature is there as well, but there's also that inscription referring to, to Bach. So then, Sidney Hurwitz, who by the way is an absolute um, sweetheart, uh, he by the way, he's also Jewish, hello. Um, so he chose, right, so Ashley Bryan is, is painting a scene from the New Testament, Ashley, I mean, um, Sydney is painting scenes from um, the Old Testament, uh, from the Book of Psalms, uh, several, you know, mostly uh, Psalm 104, several, he kind of exerted several verses. Um, he said those verses, all together deal with creatures inhabiting the earth. And that, that's also his words, epitomize this dependence of both God and man and animals on an order in nature. It's all about harmony, right? It's about the land being plentiful. It's about, if you look there, animals and humans living in harmony, right? You get a couple of lions in the background. The humans don't seem to be worried about the presence of those rather, you know, usually uh, ferocious animals. You've got birds, uh, the humans are cultivating the land, getting fruits from the land. Um, so it's about that kind of harmony, it's about the plentiful quality of, um, of the earth. Um, there's also Harmony, and, and on the other scene, uh, they're fishing, so they're also, you know, getting um, sustenance from the land and the earth. Um, of course, uh, seeing those those uh, those figures on the boat might remind you of the apost of the apostles. It really very much resembles scenes of the apostles in their boat, as Christ um, um, kind of the so-called vocation of the apostle scene when they're invited by Christ to join um, you know, his followers. And notice how cleverly taking Ashley's composition, on the land side of his composition, Hurwitz depicted the land. On the Sea of Galilee side of the composition, Hurwitz painted uh, a body of water. So there's also harmony between uh, the two 
bodies of work. And here's what the, the student who um, worked on, on her wits, uh, what um, that student concluded. The student noticed also that you had windows right next to Hurwitz's uh, uh, frescoes. And they said the window right next to Hurwitz's frescoes illuminates the scenes, adding to the frescoes' message of harmony with nature, demonstrating how God permeates nature and the everyday, as well as how the outside world permeates the meeting house itself. Isn't that lovely? So, the ceiling. Um, okay. Interestingly, several things are fascinating. The artist's name is Edwin Brooks. We know um, he was born in 1929. We know he was uh, African-American. There's a long history of African-Americans uh, at Skowhegan. Skowhegan was very inclusive already. But unfortunately, that's all we know about him. He kind of vanishes. Uh, we couldn't find any uh, further information, whether he's still alive, whether he continued doing art or not. What we know is that um, he received the fellowship. This time, the jurors were Hen John Bohr, the director of the Whitney, Ben Sean, and uh, other members of the Skowhegan School. But interestingly, Brooks was the only artist who had not previous connection to the school, which doesn't help documenting him as well, because there's good, you know, archives for the people who were, who were, who taught, who studied there or taught there, but he did not have any previous uh, connection. Um, he also uh, painted that ceiling not on a wet preparation. It's not real fresco. It's uh, painted as seco for obvious reason. His expanse was enormous. Um, and frankly, it's not fun to paint in fresco a ceiling. Read the uh, sonnet that Michelangelo composed on the occasion of his experience painting the, the Sistine ceiling. He basically hated it. Uh, he says he's in physical pain. Uh, I mean, mind you, even a seco, you're painting like that. He says he feels he's grown a goiter because, you know, his neck is so taut. His back, of course, is painful as hell. Um, he's getting all that paint that bedews his face. Um, so he's not having a great time. Which allows me to quickly tell you about the medium. And Michelangelo is a good excuse to talk about that. Um, as you know, the Sistine ceiling had to be restored. Not too long ago, but that was not the first time it was restored. It was already restored, or at least attempted, attempted to be stabilized very shortly after Michelangelo painted it. For instance, chunks were falling, so they put metal pins, like staples. Oh, and, and that was very early on, because over those staples, there was varnish that was placed. And that varnish originally was transparent, was translucent. We know it was translucent at first, because you, you know what happened? I did that when I, when I varnished the, my, my floors at my house that I painted. And as it aged, I could see the areas that were missed. And guess what? When you see the creation of Eve, in the old photos, there's a triangle placed here of varnish that had missed, that you know, had not been applied. So obviously, you know, they would have wanted to be, you know, consistent. The varnish eventually darkened because of the smoke of candles and eventually, you know, down the road much later, pollution. So it was never meant to be that yellow juice it ended up uh, becoming. They placed the varnish, which was made with, with, with animal glue. Uh, it was a kind of a glue, really, um, to s further kind of stick everything together because the whole thing was falling apart. Why was it falling apart? And why was it falling apart so soon? Because, in a nutshell, Michelangelo had no idea what he was doing. <laughs> he had not been trained. He was not a painter, or vaguely. I mean, we have um, very few paintings by his hand. He was a sculptor. He was not even from Rome, and I bet you that even the materials were different in Rome. The water was probably different in Rome. So another example of a fresco that didn't last, that didn't fare well, 
Can you think of a really famous mural that it had to be restored and still today is in absolutely crappy condition? The Last Supper, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. The problem with The Last Supper is that Leonardo did what you should never do with fresco painting. Barbara can tell you all about it. Fresco painting, I like to say, is just like baking. When you bake, you do not improvise. Because it's chemistry, right? You apply very precise measurements. And when I mentioned that Michelangelo being Florentine, doing that in Rome, who knows, maybe even the materials might have, he should have worked you know, with, with, with people from the area helping a little. Because my mom knew a pastry chef who had moved from Switzerland to the States. She had to recalculate all her recipes because the flour was different, the water was different. You know, American eggs tend to be like everything in America, huge. No, I mean, you see what I mean? So you, you don't, and Leonardo constantly um, experimented. And you know that, you can't just change the, the proportions in your cake or it might be a disaster. So how does fresco work? In a quick, quick, quick nutshell, you're usually painting on a wall and unlike here where it's you know, a wooden structure, it's usually a stone wall. So you can't just paint on a stone wall. So you need to flatten the whole area first. So you're going to apply your first kind of plaster preparation, a very rough one. All the terms are in Italian because the Italians developed the technique. Fresco existed since antiquity, but it's really the Italians who developed the technique. Quick parenthesis, it's interesting. When you think about big cathedrals, a cathedral being just a big church, and, and a church that has a special function, right? That's the seat of a bishop. But they, they tend to be in big cities, they tend to be very important buildings because they're the seat of the bishop. When you look at the north, you know, and think about the end of the Middle Ages in France, what is the way those cathedrals are decorated? Stained glass. Stained glass. And in fact, the driving engine of the Gothic style is to have windows as big as possible. So you invent pointed you know, vaults because you can go higher and it, it you know, conveys the weight in, in a very kind of, you know, it anchors the building. So that allows you to go higher, the bigger windows. You invent the flying buttresses so you can reduce the amount of support from the wall itself. You just, you know, basically put something outside that, that holds the, the door, all that, uh, the wall, all that to have very, very big windows that can be completely occupied with uh, stained glass windows. The Italians never get it. Basically, every Gothic building in Italy is a total failure. Seriously, they don't get it. Somehow, Italians remain fundamentally attached to the idea of a wall. And that is why when you have, who knows, it's a chicken and egg situation, right? Do they love the walls because they can put uh, frescoes or because they have walls, they put frescoes? We'll never know. But the fact is, that's why when you go to important churches in Italy, they are covered in very important pictorial programs painted a fresco. So, the technique. You first smooth the, 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 the surface with that rough preparation called arricchio. Then, that's when you put the preparation that gives the technique its name. Fresco, just like alfresco dining, which I called Alfredo, I don't know why. Um, but fresco means fresh. So you have to paint over that plaster preparation called intonaco while it is fresh. What happens is the pigments are sucked by this wet preparation and become one with it. So you can only paint so much before the plaster dries. And you need the right conditions. I mean, I bet you they were not painting here during in the dead of the winter. Um, the artist I studied who was painting in several places in the Alps I, can tra I could track very clearly when he was painting because it was always during the warm months. Yeah, I have another history, I guess, to, to spend time in unheated 
uh, places of worship. So yeah, you need the right also temperature. But, but if it dries, then it's not fresco anymore. So what we would do is determine areas, chunks, and we call those areas, again, an Italian word, giornata, as in a day, because it's a day's work of, a day's worth, you know, of work. If you look well, you can see scenes between the giornate, uh, especially if you use a raking light. So you can paint a secco, which is what Brooks did. And in some frescoes, you can see parts of it painted a secco. If you go to the Arena Chapel in Padua, the skies were painted over in blue to make them more intense because blue pigments are very expensive. And if you want it very intense, it's never going to be intense because again, it's being, being you know, in a way, fresco is not so different from watercolor. I mean, real watercolor, where the white of the paper is, you know, so different from gouache, which is opaque and covering. You, and, and good watercolorists know how to make the white of the page. Uh, where's Nelt? We have a great watercolorist in our, where's Nelt? Did he get, did he get bored and just leave? He did. Hmm? Oh, okay. So you will tell him I was singing his praises. Oh, but Ivor, you do watercolors as well, don't you? Well, there you go. We do, we still have a, a, a watercolorist in, in our midst. So, um, yeah, so the same way that the, 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 what you're painting on is kind of imparting a luminosity, but also the colors can't be very, very intense, right? So that's why Giotto painted over uh, the fresco a secco. But if you look at those frescoes, if you look at old photos, you'll see that it has peeled off. A secco is not as uh, permanent, right? Because it's, it's on top of things. So Brooks painted um, a secco. But yeah, I think you, I don't know if, if you could immediately tell the difference. No, not really, right? Because the, the handling between these guys is, is anyway so different. So what do we have going on? This is the most inventive part of uh, the meeting house. It's not, it's not connected to any specific passage um, in scripture, but we can try to make sense of some of the, the elements. We, we get trumpeting figures. Are they angels? Well, they don't have wings, but you know, Michelangelo had done that. Uh, in the Sistine, the angels have no wings, so there you go. We can still think they're angels. Um, we can think about those, those figures, if they're angels, those trumpeting figures, in two ways. We find trumpeting angels at the Nativity. We also see trumpeting figures at the Last Judgment. So in a way, it kind of you know, encompasses uh, the beginnings, uh, the beginning of, of you know, Christianity, if you will, and, and the very end of times. Um, we do get like two, well, we get this huge head that Brooks referred to as, um, well, a transcendental godhead. And here's what Brooks said when he, when he thought about his composition. The people who used the building believed in plain living and high thinking. And I like to believe that if they could have accepted the idea of decoration at all, good point, good point, Edwin. Um, we don't know, right? They were Protestants, so I don't know. But if they could have accepted the idea of decoration at all, they might have accepted this symbol. Call it a transcendental godhead. More on that transcendental godhead in a minute. But let's look at what else we have. So we've talked about the angels, we've talked about the head. We get here in this uh, egg-like or mandorla shaped uh, halo, uh, a little baby. Does it ring? What it, who is he? Christ, baby Jesus. He's got a halo. And indeed, on the opposite side, we get Christ, right, holding the cross. So, in a way, the reason why he was born, right, the reason he was incarnated, and then uh, the moment right afterwards, or the symbol of why he came to earth, right, uh, to redeem humanity. 
Now, interestingly, and this is just my idea, my, 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 what I see here, and the students who wrote on Brooks mentioned that in her essay, uh, I don't think Brooks was aware of it because even among art historians, very few people know about what I'm going to refer to in a sec, but maybe because he was just thinking about the issues, he came up with a solution. This head looks suspiciously like what people in the Middle Ages came up with to represent, when they tried to represent something that is unfathomable, but still you would want to think about it, that is referred to as the beatific vision. That is seeing God face to face when you finally make it to heaven. Um, the depictions of the beatific vision tend to be a bit goofy because you have people in heaven and in the middle this absolutely gigantic, a little goofy head. And it's almost like, really, I have to be a good girl all my life to then see that? I think I'll have fun and go with the fun people in hell. Because. But, you see his idea, the transcendental Godhead, right? Something you get to experience and look at the, the location, right? Right above uh, the pulpit. So an absolutely fascinating um, ensemble and decoration. Turn again, I'll point to what we have uh, in the, the, the loft. Um, we get angels playing uh, music by John Wallace. Uh, he was invited by uh, Mrs. Blake and um, the, the professors at the school. Um, the choice is an obvious one. I could give you lots of Renaissance examples of choir lofts um, where the choir would be. And often, uh, they would be, be decorated, usually on the balcony, kind of on the outside, with musician angels, because that's the place where you would put a choir. That's where you would play music. So a kind of a logical uh, idea to place angels. Um, each of them, you can see, you could, you could start spending time, you could spend some time looking at the different instruments they're, they're playing. You get a kind of a, a full um, a concert uh, up there. Wallace joked, actually he made a joke that uh, a realist painter in the 19th century had not made as a joke but said very seriously, I'm never going to paint an angel, I've never seen an angel, or show me an angel, I'll paint one. I think it's Courbet who said that. Um, so Wallace said, hey, I've never seen an angel. Um, so in order to paint angels, he chose as models some of his classmates at Scarigan. Um, so by the time he's painting that, now we're in 1954. Uh, Brooks painted actually the ceiling uh, the year after. This is from 55. Um, if you look at how they're placed, it's, it's a wonderful um, composition. Uh, it's both dynamic, it's both very harmonious, very balanced. Uh, we have an even number of angels on each side, uh, six and six. Uh, and yet, uh, there's no, it's not boring, it's not static, uh, there's movement, and yet it really functions very well within the space. You'll notice when you go up and then you come down from the loft, uh, the very last one who's playing the cymbals, actually echoing um, another angel at the very beginning here, also playing the cymbals, uh, turned in, right? So he really kind of, and, and fits in so well with the curvature of the ceiling there, but this one here is already kind of coming down along the, the stairs. Um, beautiful harmony of color. He too has a very um, kind of um, gestural style. Let's not forget that as, as these painters are working here, right, in, in the 50s, what is the, 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 the um, style? what is the kind of art that people are making in America at the time? It's abstract expressionism, right? It, 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 it's about gestural um, application of paint, it's about mark making, and so many of them in their different ways, you know, in their personal styles, have that gestural um, quality, and, and definitely uh, it's the case uh, for, for Wallace. 
And then um, when we go up, but you can, I, I think you can kind of see it from here. Uh, I hope those who are uh, closer to the wall can see it. We have two more panels uh, by two different artists. It's the same student who studied both. Uh, here we get uh, by uh, a, a woman who, who then spent her life in Chicago. Um, at the time, she was Judith Roth. Then she became Judith Schumann. Uh, and she painted uh, Noah's Ark. Uh, she was invited by, um, by the faculty. Uh, by now, we're in 56. So this is, we're completing the, the program at the time. Um, and she said about her contribution, it's Noah's Ark. There to a very personal rendition of it. Very stormy sea. Um, usually when you see depictions of, of Noah's Ark, you have the animals going into the ark, or the animals coming out of the ark. We don't see any animals. We don't see Noah. We just see the ark at sea. With a sign of hope, we have the bird that signaled that the waters were receding by bringing back um, uh, a branch right from, from, from the earth. Um, interestingly, the do it's a dove who seems to be carrying um, a, 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 an olive um, branch, right? So the, the traditional symbol of peace. Um, but the sea is still very stormy. It, it's hard to, to be completely confident that um, they will make it back to, to the land bef and, and not you know, have a, a shipwreck before uh, they, they make it, because that sea is, is really quite, um, quite stormy. Um, and um, she said that she chose some of the elements to kind of echo some of the scenes. You notice that um, her panel is right next to Abraham, and she saw in, in the way she was depicting, well, it really doesn't reach there, depicting the, the bird um, echoes a little bit the, the scythe of, uh, of, of um, Abraham, right? Kind of uh, that, that destructive weapon and almost Abraham le there looks almost like an image of death, right? With, um, well, the, the dove of peace kind of echoes it. Um, she also said that um, the motion of the water, uh, she was trying to emulate, uh, echo a little bit the angels that Wallace had painted in the, um, the choir loft. So it's wonderful because we have all these different artists and yet they are aware of each other, right? Whether they're working together like Brian and Hurwitz or something was already painted as, you know, what happened for, for Judith as she's looking at what Blaustein and Wallace had done before her, but trying to, to being aware of what's there already. So finally, on the other panel, uh, this is Sigmund Abilis, who was born in 34. He uh, was pretty much the baby of the lot because he was 22 years old when he painted uh, that panel, which explains why he's still alive and kicking. Uh, he's now retired from teaching, but um, um, we had a, a Zoom meeting with him with a student who worked on, on this section. Um, he had said already, it's, or, it's quoted in, in, in Millie's, Millie Cummings's book, the subject of man in actual combat with a force other than the here and now, tangible, uh, seemed to symbolize the real conflict of ourselves with ourselves or with the problems outside the blame of man's society. So that's why he chose the scene of uh, Jacob wrestling the angel and really thinking about that scene as being much more than just what happens to Jacob in the Old Testament, but it's about inner conflict and, and how uh, it's an eternal kind of, of subject. And um, in fact, uh, Abilis was at the time um, and, and, and remained very dedicated um, to, he was at the time active in, in the civil rights movement. So it's the theme of struggle and that, that kind of profound um, struggle. More on that um, in a minute. Um, so I'll quickly tell you what's outside, but before we, we look at that, I want to tell you why this, very briefly. You can sit down again if you want to rest um, for, for a minute. Because what's happening here 
is the product of two threads coming together. And this is why this, I mean, there's nowhere on earth something similar to this. And the reason is, is double. One is, yes, fresco being taught at Skavigan since its inception. So first question, why was fresco taught at uh, Skavigan so early? Well, the idea of teaching fresco at, at Skavigan has to do with a revival of the medium of fresco in the 20th century. Who revives fresco painting in the 20th century? Hmm? I don't think he did frescoes. Who else? Soldier who? came back from Europe. Who? Soldier. Soldier. No, it happened before. The Mexican muralist. Oh. <laughs> you, you'll be like my students. I didn't dare. I knew it. <laughs> I was thinking it. <laughs> you were obviously given your reaction. So yes, the. the and there's another revival. Let me just tell you, in, I'll tell you about that second one. It's the revival of religious art, also in the 20th century. More on this in a second. So it started in the 20s in Mexico with artists such as those who, three of them that then become known as Los Tres Grandes, Diego Rivera, Jose Clemente Orozco, and sorry, I, I was born in Argentina, so I have a weird accent in Spanish and David Alfaro Siqueiros. And they worked in that interwar period here in America. In fact, uh, Henry Varnum Poor, one of the founders of the school, was among the artists who, contrib uh, who also painted fresco, a fresco at Sai, worked with Rivera. More on Rivera in a second, and, and, and the school, just to wait. Uh, but, Poor was, uh, was a WPA artist, and he created frescoes in several US buildings, starting in the 30s, so he had really practiced it quite a bit. For instance, in 36, assisted by Anne Poor, he painted frescoes on the theme of the act activities of justice for the DC headquarters of the Department of Justice. He also painted frescoes for, the, for Pennsylvania State College. In fact, it's fascinating, when he did that in 1940, it was stipulated that he should be painting them, allowing the public to come see him do it. He had, in order to accept, the, to be aware of that, and be willing to let public come and, and see him do it. Gets better, because it comes closer to us. Then Sean, who was of course not one of the founders, but very much um, associated with the school, uh, was instrumental with Varnum Poor in establishing the fresco program. It's because Poor had done uh, frescoes, right, with Anne, and let's not forget Anne, and then Sean had also a past uh, with fresco that they decided we shall teach fresco at Skavigan. How did Sean learn the medium? Well, he was the assistant. I love this part, you'll see why. He was the assistant to Diego Rivera when Rivera was painting the, unfortunately, infamous Man at the Crossroads fresco at Rockefeller Center, which unfortunately is no more because in the fresco there was bingo. Did, you everybody, did everybody hear? There was Lenin. Where it gets really delightful is Rivera had this assistant, Ben Sean, helping him. A young lady from Ohio who was working for a newspaper in Ohio was sent to cover this event. Rivera painting a fresco at Rockefeller Center. She fell in love with Ben Sean. And she became the mother of dear friends who live up the road. Abby Sean, the daughter of Ben Sean. Abby wouldn't be on earth if Bernarda Bryson had been sent to New York to cover for her Ohio newspaper. I mean, how cool is that, right? If, if another journalist would have been sent instead, no Abby, 
no, um, no Amanda Slam and um, Mimosa Mac. No, by the way, I strongly recommend their woodwork. There's a very good craft store uh, in town. If you're interested, I can tell you where it is. Go buy their woodwork. No, they reopened. Oh, so they just had the sale before really reopening in Because I missed the sale. The price, I'm, uh, anyway, let's not go there. So, um, yeah. Spray woodwork, exactly. So there will, it will, the, the craft store in town will reopen, go get their stuff. It's spectacular. Mm -hmm. Where Ivor exhibits as well. <laughs> so, yeah, I mentioned Abilis. Um, we talked about Rivera. Let's not forget one thing. This is really important and, and, and interesting, right? Because we have this extremely left-wing dimension to, the mur to muralism, right? And yet, here they are painting a place of worship. But here's the thing, it, it kind of comes together when um, Adili, speaking at an event here with some of the surviving artists, that was in 07, said that he, had dre dre he was dreaming at the time of becoming a Mexican muralist for the civil rights movement. Okay, so the idea of painting frescoes coming closer to America, but this is still not explaining why this, right? A place of worship with frescoes. And this, the, also the, the clue or the, the answer to why Jews painting frescoes in a Christian place of worship, the answer is coming. Second revival. Second revival, also during the 20th century, also starts abroad. This time in France, in post-World War uh, France, when a Dominican friar called Marie-Alain Couturier decides to revive religious art and founds a, new, a journal called uh, Sacred Art and starts all kinds of programs of, of you know, churches with decoration by cutting edge contemporary artists. Uh, for instance, those of you might have seen photos of a chapel in the Riviera in Vence, where you have Matisse um, kind of painted tiles and uh, a chapel, a baptismal area decorated by Marc Chagall, Jewish artist. In fact, he was completely uh, ecumenical his goal was to create art that was spiritual. And there's a very famous story, very revealing, when Couturier was hiring for one of his projects, Jacques Lipschitz, who obviously was Jewish. And so, trying to hire him, and Lipschitz said, <clears throat> I hope you know I'm Jewish. It was for a church, right? And so Couturier answered, if it doesn't bother you, it does not bother me. And in fact, for one of the churches, um, Fernand Léger, who was a communist, was completely atheist, did the, the decoration over the entrance. Again, because they were interested in creating spaces that are truly numinous, truly spiritual, regardless of religion, which really explains what's happening here. Still, I'm talking about stuff happening across the pond in France. How does that come to America? Well we can thank a French lady, but one with American connections, Dominique de Menil, who's been to Houston. Nobody? Oh my God. Go to the Menil Foundation. So John and Dominique de Menil, who were of course in base there because of the oil, uh, had money, started collecting, and Dominique de Menil was friends with Couturier. And those of, you might have seen photos of the famous Rothko Chapel on the grounds of the Menil Foundation, right? Which is a completely non-denominational um, spiritual place with paintings by uh, Rothko. And this is exactly where this is coming from, this idea of reviving 
uh, religious art uh, in the 20th century. So I'll quickly tell you what we have outside, or we can, I think we can try to um, be very um, friendly and get close to each other and look what we have in, in the lobby and see if that works. We can see better. Um, so these are by Sidney Simon. So you'll try to look at both. They're the four elements. So it's a really interesting choice because, so the four elements, fire, water, earth, and air, um, are typically paired in thinking with four other important things, the four seasons, the four ages of, of, of people, people will say the four ages of man, but you get my point, the four times of day, right? Uh, two long ones, day and night, and two transitional ones, dusk and dawn. So in a way, with the idea of the four elements, you get something that is very encompassing, right? It's, it's, it's everything, it's time, it's, it's the world, etc., etc. Don't lean on the fresco, sorry. I feel like a guard in a museum. Um, so the, the four elements are also uh, split into two. Like I said, for the times of day, we have long ones, short ones, so two and two. Um, you have typically two active ones, um, and therefore considered masculine, uh, fire, and, uh, and air, and then two feminine ones. The, the, the feminine and masculine also comes from Romance languages, where the words are in the feminine grammatical gender or masculine gender, right? Uh, L'aqua, la, or l'eau, um, water, la terre, it's feminine, il faut que le feu, masculine, and uh, l'air, uh, masculine as well. So here we get um, uh, water and, uh, and earth, right? So the two more, more <coughs> passive, notice how, how quiet it is. There you can very well see the signature. So in the lobby, we have people who were the professors, who are not, you know, selected, etc., etc. Um, so very kind of much more, uh, you, you could make another opposition, right? Extroverted, introverted. Uh, right, notice how the, the body's kind of enclosed into itself, he's looking down, um, but we get dynamism um, in the water, also a, a color scheme that is a little bit toned down, and the opposite side, so he's really cleverly using those two uh, areas, uh, we get um, fire, here's a, a Prometheus-like figure uh, holding uh, fire, um, oh, and, and air. air. Air is difficult to represent, right? But so we get a very kind of turbulent, movemented sky uh, that suggests a little bit this movement, especially since he's dealing with the two elements that are supposed to be the two active elements. And also a very different uh, color scheme. So now, if you want to open the doors, that will help looking at uh, the other scenes. Maybe you can just turn and we can look at, uh, this is by, by Willard Cummings. As I told you, now we can leave it open to get light. Um, so yeah, this is Willard Cummings. Um, and maybe you can look at it carefully afterwards. As I told you, he was very much famous as a portrait painter. And so he was uh, he decided to paint this group portrait, which, you know, in a way, with, with Sidney Simons's paintings, that uh, uh, Simons paintings that are all encompassing four elements that allude to kind of time in its kind of uh, all encompassing nature. This is the same thing because these are real people, past and present. Um, so we have, I can't remember the name, some of the reverends of the time, Reverend Pete, and um, by the way. He, Carrying a model of the church, of the building itself, which you find in, I mentioned earlier on, the Arena Chapel painted by Giotto. You have the donor, Enrico Scroveni, who decided to give the church so he wouldn't go to hell because his dad had gone to hell in the Divine Comedy for being a usurer. So all of a sudden, he thought, oh my God, maybe I should clean up my act. So he stopped being a usurer, didn't follow the, the family business, and gave um, this, this chapel dedicated to the Madonna of Charity. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, but you see him represented holding a model of the church, giving it um, to um, you know, holy figures. In this case, this 
building is being given to the community. That's really the idea. This is an, an image of com community, community across time, because we have historical figures, uh, contemporary figures. Um, I think this is uh, I think this is Mrs. Blake. Um, this was the, the guy, uh, what was his name, something, Laurier? I was going to say, you know Sean Thornton, who's the baker at Skowhegan? It looks just like oh. him. <laughs> well, this is the sign that it's a good portrait. Yes. You know, when, when you think immediately of a real person. But this was a real person. I can't remember his first name, his last name was Laurier, and he was the, the groundskeeper. Who apparently, I think, was the guy who rebuilt the, the wall, I think. So anyway, you can re recognize the, the, the older figures. He used um, images, for, for instance, daguerreotypes, you know, documents to, to actually do real portraits of the people. So an image of community, past and present. It is flanked, it is framed by these uh, friezes of flowers that were done by Anne Poor. Um, it still annoys me a little bit that the MD, well, one of the rare women who contributed yeah. to uh, the painting, and what does she get to do a little slip And flowers. Mm. Oh, flowers. <laughs> but upstairs, the other woman had just a small... No, it's not. Place. Well, there was not much remaining by then. No, I know. But, but they could have hired a woman before. A little early. Absolutely. In the process. Yeah. Well, but, and and poor did her own yards as well. Right. In the turn the... Yeah, that's right. She was so the flowers she chose are all uh, real plants. My students who worked on this identified every single uh, plant, and um, the colors vary. So it's very much also kind of the four seasons there, and and it's lovely because it really ties the inside and the outside, right? Bringing it inside, and everybody's leaving, but. There's the, are we really running late, or? Uh, yeah, the okay. restaurant. Oh, like, oh, she's gone to call the restaurant. It's a good have told me. It's fine. So, you Excuse me. Yeah, I know. That's, that's the last one. So, this is Henry Harlan Poor, and this is hysterical, because uh, it's definitely not religious, although when asked, he said, oh, this is the Lord appearing to old King Kate. And, and King Kate was actually the guy who owned his farm, near Lake Wasserand said. The student who worked on, and I was really worried because this is not an easy fresco to work on. I mean, what do you say about that? First of all, I mean, he had talked about the sky, or in, in, in Mildred Cummings' book, she talks about the macro sky, which is a sky we observe in Maine in the summer. Yeah. It is true, it exists. So, it, and it's the farm. We haven't been able to, to, to be told where it was. I'm dying to try to find it, to see if the building is still there. So it is a real place, a real building. It's old Kincaid who's holding pails of milk. But one thing my student noticed, and what she ended up writing on, which really impressed me because it was so clever. First of all, the figure is turned towards the inside. So he really kind of ushers you into um, the, the place of worship. Um, and she noticed how um, he's lit, he's looking up, and there's definitely light on his forehead. And so she compared that to other images of figures being enlightened, right? Having kind of a, a, a religious, um, you know, a revelation. And of course, where's the light coming from? But, you know, from inside the, the place of worship. So she ended up making really good sense of this painting. And then what, you know, some of the students also talked about is and I hadn't had time to tell you about that. Remember, the Skowhegan School was, was established on the grounds of a farm. And, and when you go there still today, you see the studios, they're open to the elements. They leave, you know, it's in the summer, they leave the doors open. Nature is constantly a presence. So even though back in the days when it was first created, sure, plein air painting was very much part of the curriculum. I doubt most of the artists who go to Scandinavian today are doing plein air painting. I don't think they're out with their watercolors right now. They're probably doing, you know, brainy kind of conceptual art or whatever. Still, the presence of the na of nature is part of the ethos of Skavigan, the idea to have a, uh, an art school on the grounds of, you know, a main farm with, with lots of acres uh, and a lake um, makes For sense. many and people who have never left the city to come to a farm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
the dark. Well, the same thing happens at Colby. Right. You know, we have CT kids who want to get the hell out of there because, oh my God, I mean, it's one of my students who ended up loving it, she said, but there's no mall nearby. <laughs> there's no what? Mall. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's about it. I think we should go. All right, thank you.